Hi, it's Mark Pasternak. I have a question about choosing the members of the committee. Yes, please. It seems like that is one of the crucial steps in the whole process. You can imagine, say, that the controversies of Lyme disease treatment, you know, there's regular doctors uh, backed by the Infectious Disease Society of America, Absolutely. and the Lyme literate doctors who were backed by the International Lyme and Associated Disorders, whatever. Um, and they tried to form guidelines and it became a matter of numbers, you know, how many of the Lyme <laughs> are on the committee and how many IDSA doctors are on the committee and um, it was quite controversial. Well, so, look, I think I, I, it would be foolish of me to say that the consensus process I described can somehow magically deal with and resolve the controversy. <laughs> but I think what it does is it makes the process of generating the consensus transparent so it is possible for you to report at each stage what percentage of agreement took place or what percentage of di alternatively to describe the same information as what percentage of disagreement took place and then the second and third rounds of discussions can allow an opportunity for discussion and resolution of disagreement so I agree with you that the, con the composition of the panel is perhaps the most challenging task. <coughs> but I propose to you and I put to you that uh, transparent and well-established methodology employed to generate consensus allows for the disagreements to be resolved, and if not resolved, to be made transparent in the process of creating the guideline. So how did, in that last example that you shared with us, yeah. how were the members of the committee selected? Was okay. there... So I explained this to you, uh, taking you back to the slide that I attempted to show earlier. Basically, in our project, we first had a core group of colleagues. Uh, this consensus involved around 30 people, but the core group had around five or six people. These five or six people listed these exposures or competencies on the left-hand side where I'm passing the cursor. Mm -hmm. And we said that for each of these, there must be representation. We cannot leave them empty. Okay, then the core group looked in its own group of contacts, experts, or uh, in inverted commas, professional friends who they could approach and see if the gaps in this list of expertise, experience, or exposure concerning the condition can be met. And when these could not be met, we ask them to recommend others. So this technique is called snowballing. So this snowballing technique allows you to use the knowledge, contact, experience, exposure of the group of experts or panel members or participants as they grow to inform the inclusion of newer members in order to deal with a and uh, with an outlined list of uh, of uh, of expertise exposure or relevant experience required to help create the priority for each statement So I guess, so are you... given your description of a process called snowballing, there is an alternate process where, for example, through society memberships or other such uh, methods, you can obtain lists of relevant uh, experts or professionals 
And then from those lists, you can use a method of uh, inviting people, which may be based on uh, randomization or other method of classifying experience or uh, relevance of the, of the membership. I agree with you, it's not an easy task. So, uh, Doctor, you're, you're saying that a core group coalesces, they choose to be the core group. Yes. But once you have a, once you have a core group, individuals can't, not, can't say, um, well, I want to be part of your group. Well, well, I guess they can say it, but whether they're chosen to participate or not would be at the discretion of the core group by invitation using the core group's decisions regarding uh, this sort of list of criteria. Someone can't just sign up and say, I'm now a member of the consensus panel. Okay, so look, what I say now is my is based on my personal experience of doing various service. I think in your field, you are dealing with something fairly specialized. And I think you are far better to select the group membership based on some criteria. I give you an example of a difficulty that could arise to, to demonstrate that this is not an easy task. For example, in, the, in this particular project, when we are dealing with clinical trial integrity, it is possible that somebody who considers themselves a clinical trial expert has, at the time of conducting the consensus project, their own clinical trial under investigation. In this case, I think for such a person, even though they have the expertise, because they are under particular pressure, they may not be able to contribute objectively. So there are more features than simply the relevant experience or exposure of potential participants that would need to be taken into account. And I think the issue of society membership was mentioned earlier, but relationship with industry is also a relevant issue, uh, which I think you would need to consider. For example, you may ask those who want to be members to declare their conflicts of interest using a particular pro forma and the core group may evaluate those in order to decide whether it would be appropriate for those individuals to be members or not I, i'm I not sure want... i've helped solve the problem but i certainly hope to have highlighted the difficulty and the need to develop a transparent process through which people will enter the membership. I, I want to share an anecdote from our Please first do. attempt at provoking uh, or, or generating uh, guidelines. Uh, a core group was formed, and as the snowball process, I think, explains or describes well how many of the people came to the meetings that led to the guidelines. But the guideline was very neutral about performing tonsillectomies. Mm -hmm. And um, some years later, one of the ENT doctors who sees a lot of these children said, you know, the guidelines were wrong, that the tonsillectomy should be promoted more aggressively. And then he said, after all, you had no ENT surgeons in the room. No wonder it didn't get addressed. And he was right. There were no ENT surgeons in the room. Whether that would have changed the position of the committee, I. I I wouldn't venture a guess, but it just points out how challenging it is to find kind of all the right contributors. Well, ab absolutely. So I think one of the things that could help uh, is to look at what I described here and taken from a project concerning 
chronic pelvic pain. Now we listed all the relevant people who could potentially be involved in delivery of care. And then try to find at least one representative from each group. I think once you have all the bases covered, one potential problem could be that some groups are overrepresented. Mm -hmm. So it's, it isn't just a question that somebody is missing. It can also be a question as to some other group were far too, had far too many members and were able to vote others down or the opinion of others down. Right. Well, it, I, I, I should also say, um, I, I, uh, I've been involved in the process of making guidelines uh, over at least two decades, including working at the World Health Organization on, uh, on, on a couple of guidelines. Uh, I think the expectation should not be that the guideline will be permanently correct. <laughs> I think the expectation should be that uh, at some stage, as evidence changes, and possibly uh, as, uh, as, as, pre as presented in the previous anecdote, as membership of the consensus panel changes, perhaps in a future update, the guideline can change and will change in the correct direction. So my personal view is that, the, that a guideline is not a permanent thing that must be right on the first attempt and will be right forever. I think it's very important for everyone to internalize. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't mind me showing you some of the results already available in the public domain from this publication, perhaps it will help to give an idea of how giving the numerical data help improve their transparency. So I'll just go to the web and I hope I can find this uh, paper easily and quickly. You can still see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. So here is the, the preprint, which has been available since June last year and has more than a thousand views. And I know from feedback received from the journal chief editor that in fact, uh, people who have reached the, the preprint have independently provided input to the journal, apart from the, the peer reviewers appointed by the journal. And we have had to respond to those comments. So uh, we've dealt with these, uh, these, these issues raised. Um, so here is what the draft looks like. Um, let me see if I can even make the screen bigger so you can see more. Yeah, right. I think that's a bit better. Look, here are the tabulated statements, which you're going to see in just a second. Here, it's possible to give for each statement, what was the percentage of agreement by the panel member. And you can see that some statements will be quite uncontroversial. You have more than 90% people saying, well, this is great, we should do this. <laughs> On the other hand, here you have just a little over 60% agreement in the first round. Then it is repeated and in fact, the level of agreement does not change at all, perhaps, some individuals change their opinion, but the overall percentage agreement does not change. And then it does not pass the threshold. And it got to be taken to the consensus meeting. And only then while the experts have a discussion and are able to explain their individual viewpoints to each other, that finally it is possible to reach agreement. So here, I think it would be reasonable to expect that if this consensus exercise were repeated a year or two later, perhaps with a slightly different composition of the panel, that this statement may in fact never pass the threshold and may be removed. 
So I strongly urge uh, colleagues present in this meeting to not think of uh, guideline as something that will be permanent and correct forever. Mm -hmm. I think the transparency achieved concerning each statement through this process is as valuable or perhaps as important as the statements that pass forward into being part of the guideline. That's helpful. Is the published form of the guideline a series of 87 or whatever, like numbered statements, or is it written in more traditional paragraph form? Uh, well, it's a, okay. So this is a, a point that I wish to bring to your attention also. So look, some of these statements, um, have these uh, these little lettered numbers attached to them, lettered uh, lettered superscript attached to the numbers. These are in fact mixtures of two separate statements combined together. So when we obtain, we, when we ask people to give their opinion, it is better to ask them to give them an opinion on a single matter. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, we might say, uh, we, we, let's take the, yeah, the t t take the example of statement number two. We might say trialists, ethics committee members, editors, peer reviewers should receive appropriate methodological training. This could be one statement. Another statement could be these people should receive appropriate integrity training. I think the panel members are much better to vote on these two separately in the rounds when we collect data. And these can then be merged together because they make sense together. However, in another statement, it is possible that the methodological training may be voted out and only integrity may remain and move forward to be included in the statement. Did, did that make sense through my explanation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now, once these statements are listed, some of these statements might require clarifiers. Uh, let me just take an example, if I can also find it more quickly. Um, session. One. Okay, where is that one? Let me, let's see. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm struggling to find a particular story, but I'll just let you know uh, which one it is uh, from memory and comment as to how it was dealt with. Uh, at the time of publication in a clinical trial, okay, here it is, statement number 40. Professional medical writing could help in reporting more clearly and succinctly to meet the integrity requirement. And its contribution should be reported. So look, here, it's a controversial statement because it has not reached a very high level of agreement. And the last column, number 36, provides the reference source from which this reference is, this statement is generated. Look, the statement is potentially highlighting that clinical trialists should use professional writing companies. Now, many clinical trialists would even consider it an insult that such an advice should be given to them. Well, that may be true for native English speakers, uh, but don't forget that a very large proportion of clinical trials are performed by people who are not native English speakers. And for them, a writing company could offer them uh, help. And this kind of a clarifier can be included in the discussion or results section of such a paper. And this is exactly what has happened in this case. 
In this case, uh, the discussion section clarifies that this statement comes from a published literature. It does not come from a member who owns a medical writing company. And it also shows that in order for transparency, all the members have been asked to comment on what interest they have with respect to uh, writing. And if they have such an interest, they can report that in their uh, uh, conflict of, of interest declaration um, as openly as possible. I, I hope that makes sense also when it comes to statements that are difficult in nature and need clarification. It, it sounds like an overlying point you're making is that the more succinct and, and specific and single each statement is when it's being reviewed, the more clarity there will be in understanding how the consensus has decided its value. Absolutely. So in this particular statement that I've highlighted in front of you, it did not pass the threshold for approval in the first round. It transpired through feedback from colleagues who voted in the first round that they would like a clarifier that the contribution of the medical writer's input should be explicitly reported in the manuscript of the trial. And through this clarification, in the second round, it was able to achieve approval. Even though in the second round, the approval is not at an 80 or 90% level. Therefore, a reader who sees these data can see that this statement has a lower strength of priority given by the group. Mm -hmm. So thinking ahead, you know, we, we did draft guidelines, you know, as Mark Pasternak was alluding to 10 years ago, and Jay Geed has a comment in in the chat talking about the fact that very few guidelines and diagnostic criteria rem, rem, have remained unchanged oh so have remained unchanged over time so they do um change over time what would you suggest a process would be for us to draft new guidelines would you say to start with the old guidelines and make revisions from there with a smaller committee or um, uh, okay so yeah. uh, i i address this uh, directly first and i'm sorry if i interrupted you uh, no 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 Go you don't mind that i can continue um uh, well i think in your case from the previously existing guidelines you could begin the process by creating these single statements mm -hmm. uh that do not mix up several issues. They only deal with one issue at a time. Okay. And this list of statements could be, you could say, one that emerges from the previous guideline. Then I think to these statements, you will need to add some additional statements that may emerge from the literature review. Okay, okay, I see. Okay. And then a third set of new statements may be added that may come from your panel membership that has reviewed the previously listed statements from this from the previous guideline and from the literature review and feel that there is something that is missing and they mm -hmm. provide based on their own knowledge or experience okay so, so it would be the smaller core group or the larger panel that would sort of add additional. Okay, which... so in the first instance, I think the smaller core group will provide these additional statements. Okay. But in the, at the time of the first Delphi round, you could give an open invitation to people taking part in the survey that if you believe that anything is missing and is important, please let us know that we can include it in the second round. Okay. So this allows for at least uh, each member, whether or not they are part of the core or not core, having the opportunity to provide you their own additional statements. 
Now, please be aware that it is possible that if an expert is providing their own statement and other people have voted them down, you know, they might become upset. Mm -hmm. But also, if they are rational, like I am, <laughs> I would accept that I'm voted out. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you that of the 88 state of the out of the 111, uh, 88 were selected and uh, nearly uh, what is the right number? Uh, 30 statements that have been rejected. Many of them are my statements. But I accept that I'm voted out at, and, and that the panel come that the panel has more power over the individual within the panel, the panel together collectively has more power than the individual in the panel. This is my personal view. And mm -hmm. I enter the process of consensus with this view. So I, I and I hope other people who you will invite in your panels will take the view that their opinion is considered by colleagues. And if it is rejected, that they should be able to accept it. Uh, because the group opinion should prevail over individual opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, I also notice in the chat there are a couple of comments. Let me just have a look at them in case they'd require uh, my input or comments from other colleagues in the panel today. Um, uh, Jay. For, for an individual, Doctor, sorry, I was going to say for an individual to. Uh, for an individual to accept that they're, in their mind, well thought out and significant input has been rejected by the consensus, they would have to feel that the, the consensus group was well chosen uh, and appropriate uh, to begin with, right? Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. So we're going to have to come up as with a group with this participant criteria. I, I believe uh, so. And I think the snowballing technique allows you for group members to comment on group membership. Mm -hmm. So when the core group invites, let's say, additional 10 members, those 10 members have the opportunity to say, please invite these five others. Or in my opinion, there is a need for another area of expertise that we have not considered. Uh, and, and this way, snowballing helps to generate consensus amongst the panel members concerning appropriateness of the membership. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, I prefer snowballing over the technique that I referred to earlier, where we obtain long lists and use some form of uh, selection, which may be randomly or statistically driven. Okay, so I large, oh, go ahead. I turn to a comment that is in the meeting chat. I'm unsure if you are able to see my if the chat on the screen that I have, but if you are on Zoom, I'm sure you can go into chat and see the comments for yourself. So Jay Giet has a comment concerning. Uh, I think we already discussed Dr. Giet. Okay, we've already Sorry. covered that point. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, Dr. Cunningham had a question. When we edit to, um, to change the statement between voting cycles, do you see the historical timeline of the edits or do you just see the new statement? <clears throat> So in, I refer again to the specific project that I've described as an example. In our specific project, we have taken the liberty to be more than 100 transparent. I explained to you how through going by going back to my slides and uh, sh showing you the data sharing platform where we have presented all the statements. And here is that slide. So what we have done here is we have given the first final list in its entirety as it was first worded. Then in the first round, we have given the results 
and the changes to the wording. Then the second round, any further changes to the wording and the results. And then the final consensus. So in this way, anybody who wants to see the, the evolution of the statement until it reaches its final version is able to go back and see and comment and allow the statement to be refined, improved at some future stage following publication. Thank you. Uh, I, like I would very strongly recommend this to you when you consider your own project, because I think going forward in science publication and in guidelines, uh, yeah. transparency is what is turning out to be uh, the key feature. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Frankovich had a question. What is the typical size of consensus group and the range in your experience? I know you mentioned maybe there were 30 people in your okay. specific case that you talked about, but anything yeah, yeah. you can add? So, uh, you know, so the, it also refers, it, it, what you highlight also addresses the question of how to determine the sample size of a panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can I can tell you from my knowledge of the literature, I don't believe there is a formula for determining the sample size. Uh, I have looked at a set of panel members based projects. And you may have heard of something called Equator. Equator mm -hmm. is a website that produces reporting guidelines. So the average number of participants in reporting guideline creation projects is around 22. 22. Oh, wow. So I, was thinking I think it would be more. Well, look, I was also surprised when I found that it was 22 and was happy that the number 30 mm -hmm. of which 26 had been responding in the service uh, mm -hmm. was, in my opinion, a reasonable number. Mm -hmm. I think the number would probably also depend on the list of expertise you are looking to cover. Yeah. So I think the greater the number of expertise you're looking to cover, the greater would be the need to have more people included. Mm -hmm. And I think for ours, we're going to break it down into separate guidelines like we did originally where there are id guidelines psychiatry guidelines you know immunology rheumatology guidelines and so the panel composition may be a little bit different for each of those guidelines but then we'll probably have to have an overall strategy guideline which you know with the original guidelines we just wrote as kind of like an introduction um paper but that will my guess would need to include a lot of a lot of people because part of the, the creating the guidelines is not just about coming to consensus but giving the medical community confidence that enough people believe this is a consensus right so if we only have 22 people out of all the hundreds of children's hospitals represented it may not be accepted but if we have a larger group taking representatives from many children's hospitals across the country, then the ultimate consensus may be more accepted. Well, look, yours is a, a excellent point. This is the same experience we had through the peer review process in this article that peer reviewers said, well, 30 is too few. Or they said, well, the core groups just simply, well, in, in a more formal language, they said that the core group just simply selected their friends. Uh, okay, so we got right. yeah. uh, but it. But look, we had to deal with this problem. And one solution that we found, and I hope I can find the manuscript uh, quickly and easily to show you. Uh, you won't see it in the preprint because this will appear in the final paper um, that will be published. Uh, but I will be able to show you that just now. Um, hopefully without taking up too much time. Uh, you can see I have a complex uh, filing system.
I'm sorry, I think it might take me too long to find the relevant uh, information, but I can just tell you, we had to draw a map of the world and show on the map that the 30 experts came from 14 countries from mm. six inhabited continents of the world. Mm. And yeah. it was this, with this simple tool of a map that graphically showed the distribution that mm -hmm. we were able to convince the peer reviewer that this isn't just a selection of my friends who live around me in the city of Granada where I live. I, I, I do think, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, Jenny, to separate the topics like rheumatology and immunology and psychiatry and stuff, but at the same time, it's the same kids, right? And, yeah, yeah. and often these things are all happening at the same time. So yeah. I, writing it in sections, but I... I I'd love to be able to keep it together because it, you know the problems yeah. can't really be dissected completely so, from each other. Yeah. But also, but also show in like map of the world, fine, but map also of the specializations yes. represented uh, is almost more important here. I think. Yeah. No, we we agree. When we published them as separate sections, it's just because it was just so dense. But we had like an overall like. This is the overall management and how you integrate these different approaches. So we, I think we would have to do the same thing, just like an overall management if, achieve agreement on that. And then the, the specialties would be a deeper dive, which in the original management guidelines, it was actually got down to the doses and the, you know, monitoring, which, you know, we may not be able to do for for this consensus, we might just have to review, you know, refer to the old ones just because it would be thousands of statements <laughs> to reach agreement on. Yeah. I, I think this could be very, very challenging if you want to cover the entire subject. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the core group would need to make some prioritization with respect to the domains to be created within which statements will exist. And uh, in my experience, it is not a task that can always be done at the beginning. It may yeah. be that once the statements have been through a few rounds, the core group should meet again at that time and look at the statements, how they have been prioritized. And from that, learn what is the best way to group them into domains. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're out of time. We've taken up a lot of your time. Actually, Dr. Jaffe, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you have another comment? Oh, no. Sorry, no. I just didn't know. How okay, to you just there. left your hand up. No problem. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Um, we look forward to next steps with you all. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Yeah.